Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Ranking the Albums. Today, we got in the co-captain's chair from the west coast of the U.S. of A., we've got Mr. Rand Kelly. What's happening, Rand? As you can see, behind uh, Rand's shoulder there, a little couple pictures of uh, the great Patrick Moraz. That's what we're talking about today. We're going to rank our top five albums that Patrick Moraz has appeared on. Of course, he's been on some pretty high full pro high profile high profile releases he's got a bunch of solo albums moody blues yes refugee main horse all sorts of stuff stuff with bill bruford whatever we decided there's a lot of albums let's just pick our top five favorite moraz appearances so uh with that being said i'll let Rand go first with his uh number five pick for today all right hello everybody uh thanks thanks for having me on pete really appreciate it it's always fun to do these Okay, my first choice is uh, the Main Horse album. Is this 1971, I believe? 1971, yep. Wow, this is a corker. Uh, we were just talking about that song, Such a Beautiful Day. That's really awesome. Introduction is just freaking, what a way to start a record. Yeah. <laughs> my, my God. Holy bombast, Captain. <laughs> You know, these guys could have competed with the nice at the same time, but the nice were just already gone. Yeah. And Emerson Lincoln Palmer was already kicking. But I didn't know who this band was. I remember seeing it in the in the record rack in Eureka, California. And I looked on the back and I go, I know that guy. <laughs> that guy on the top in the middle there. So I looked down there and everything, and I said, oh, I got to buy this. And so I bought it, and it was $3 <laughs> was used. Yeah, this is, this is my number five main horse. Here's a little uh, Pete, Pete Pardo factoid. I never even heard of that album or the band or heard a lick of it until they reissued it a couple of years ago. Wow. Yeah, I don't even have it on CD, believe it or not. Yeah, I have the CD. Yeah. It's, that's that's freaking yeah. strange. It's good. It's really heavy for those watching and I'll, I'll talk a, well more to come on that album, but uh if you also, you know, Rand mentioned the Nice and ELP, which you, you kind of have to when you're talking about that band and another one we're probably going to get to here. Uh if you like early Deep Purple and you're right, Heat 2 because I think the uh, Moraz's Hammond organ tones are pretty crunchy on this album like heavy you don't really think of him as like a Hammond player but it's pretty serious and there's some good guitar riffs and solos on it too so it's a pretty rocking album I think if you it's definitely heavy prog it's not not a, I wouldn't really call it so much symphonic prog this is pretty heavy prog but uh definitely a product of its time but I I, I dig it quite a bit so that's a, a good choice got to be in this top five I think so Pat, Patrick plays organ electric piano piano glockenspiel and something called a clavio synthesizer which i have no idea what the hell that is no clue 71 it god only knows they didn't have polyphonic synthesizers in 71 so right. whatever it is it only played one note at one time yeah yeah who knows I, all right my choice for number five uh i will admit right off the bat i'm not a huge fan of his solo albums however i do like the first one pretty much. Uh, the Story of I from 1976. This is the first one. They re recorded this while he was still in Yes. But funny enough, uh, by the time it was released, and you know, he's already gone from Yes, unfortunately, but a uh, pretty good one. I mean, uh, he's playing all sorts of keyboards and instruments. It's basically the Patrick McGrath show, and there, there he is right there with the, there with the big hair. He's got this great look to him, right? Uh, him on all sorts of keys and other instruments. He's got a boatload of guest stars on here. Uh, lots of Brazilian percussion and vocals, you know, because there are vocals on some of the tracks. Uh, there's also a really strong fusion vibe on this album, which I really like. Uh, some songs that are that I like quite a bit. Warmer Hands is a really good one. That's a kick-ass fusion song with a funk element. Uh, Kachaka is catchy. It's got classical. It's got Brazilian, you know, Latin elements. Uh, Indoors is a complete blazer of a song where he's trading off since with uh, Ray Gomez on guitar. Ray Gomez, a notable fusion guitar player who's played on some really high profile albums right around the same time period. I wish there was more songs like Indoors. I would have loved 
half the album to be like indoors because I think that is a terrific, terrific fusion, fusion prog track. Um, really, really good. Uh, Rise and Fall is another proggy fusion one. I think it's a really strong album overall. Uh, covers kind of cool too. Uh, for me though, if I, I would have, I would have ditched the vocal parts. I don't know. It always like kind of like frustrated me when you had these albums in the seventies where the band is trying to do that fusion thing, or even like, uh, you know, a notable prog rock instrumentalist. And they always feel like forced, like they got to do a couple vocal tracks, but the, the vocals are not bad by any means. I just think, uh, you know, with all the really cool instrumentation on this album, I think it would have worked better as an all instrumental album, but still it's fun. Patrick Veraz, the story of I 1976. That's my number five. Well, I'll tell you who really has a big complaint about that album. It's Jeff Berlin, the bass player. He uh, said when 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 it was just uh, me, Alphonse Mizan, and Patrick playing, like in the studio rehearsing, he said it was phenomenal. He says, but but sure. Patrick overdubbed so many keyboards, the bass is gone. You you can't even hear it. Yeah, this. That you're absolutely right. There's not a big bass presence on here for the most part, which is a shame. I mean, there's some stellar players. There. I mean, I'll just read them all up. So we got John McBurn uh, on vocals, uh, Vivian McAuliffe on vocals, Ray Gomez on guitars, Jeff Berlin on bass, Alphonse Muzon on drums, Andy Newmark on drums, and then uh, assorted other people playing, you know, this, that, and the other thing. But uh, yeah, could you imagine if he did just the whole, just imagine a whole album of Miraz, Gomez, Berlin, and Muzon. Oh, yeah. Quartet. Oh, my God. Throw out all the other stuff. Throw it all out. Because if you listen to those couple of Blazers, like I mentioned, amazing songs. I would have loved a whole album of that. Unfortunately, we never got it. So, yeah. But, like I said, it's still it's still a really strong album. In my opinion, it's his best solo album. So, uh, but it, it could have been, this could have been like absolute perfection. As it is, it's really strong. Not quite perfection, but I like it. Yeah, I think if you're a keyboard fan, you can appreciate all the different things going on. Uh, it's the introduction of the Vaco Orchestron, uh, which was like a laser beam Mellotron, set up like a, you know, like like the laser disc in the early '80s. Yeah. This was this was a keyboard that was just freaking way ahead of the future. You know, I mean, it it was going to put the Mellotron to shame, but it didn't really take off. It it was too heavy and too you know, it just didn't, uh, there aren't that many out there. I mean, I got a Mellotron and it's got the Orchestron samples in it. And when you go to play like one key, you can hear the confusion thing from that album. And you can also hear that uh, Brazilian thing where they go, I just push one key down and it does that. <laughs> but it doesn't translate well on this internet thing. I'll have to send it to you in a private <laughs> message. But it's so cool. Uh, it, it, you know, the uh, the Patrick Morass stuff he does on the beginning of the uh, Hold, Hold Out Your Hand by Chris Squire, yeah. that organ part right there. That's on the first four keys of the Mellotron. I can just push them one after another and get the whole thing with all the solos and all that. It's amazing. That's it's not cool. talent, but it's amazing that they decided to put all that in it there. It sounds good to these, right? That's all that matters. Exactly. <laughs> if it sounds, who said if it sounds good, it is good? Who killed yeah. that? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. I, I personally, I love that album, but, but more on that later. So it, it's my turn to go next. Yes. I'm going to go with uh, Patrick Mraz out in the sun. I swear to God, that's Lake Mead in, outside of Las Vegas, but I could be wrong. But anyways, uh, yeah, I really like the sound a lot. It, there's a lot of mini Moog on it. Uh, there's a whole song that's just nothing but mini Moog running through an Echoplex. And John McBurney's vocals, I don't have a problem with him. I think I think he's a fine singer. Um, but yeah, this is a strange picture, isn't it? They got him in a silhouette like he's not really there. It's kind of like Led Zeppelin presence, isn't it? Yeah. Kind of a black shadow. <laughs> putting on a shadow. You can't mistake the mane, though, right? No, you can't, you can't mistake the hair. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's for sure. Yeah, but this is good. I mean, it, this is a rocking album. I think this is really good. Um, Later on, he, he, I think he gets into too much uh, Brazilian percussion and stuff. Oh, yeah, I was going to tell you that one of the songs I, I did, like, uh, I think it's Tentacles. It's just, a, it, basically, it's a mini mode solo. But the, the best stuff on this album, I always thought was on side two. And nobody's doing LPs anymore, hardly. But, yeah. you know, 
these albums they do break break away from each other i mean when you get to the bottom track of side one to side two i've always felt that it's a different kind of thing like if you just sit down and listen to a brand new album would you play side two no nobody ever does so yeah so it's you know i think it's really good it came out right after i and uh I forgot what year that was. Yeah, I think it was what 77? Oh, 70, 77, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's pretty good. I, I you know, it, that's one of my honorable mentions. And I, I think those two albums are really the only solo albums of his that I can enjoy. From, you know, the, the, after that, it starts to, for me anyway, it goes a little off the rails. But, uh, but oh, those, yeah, oh, yeah, I hear you. The playing is I fantastic. You. I mean, obviously, yeah. And another thing, too, I listened to uh, last night, uh, I think it was on that song. Uh, introduction on main horse he does that circle of forest that you hear on yes awaken and he always said he wrote it i think that's where it came from yeah it could be because uh it doesn't seem to exist anywhere else which is really weird yep yep all right my number four i thought long and hard about this and uh i really like this album and i really like his playing on it and I thought he brought a kind of a cool element to the band, a long distance for long distance forager from the Moody Blues from 1981. It's his first album with the Moody's. Um, his synth work is excellent on this entire album. And, and he totally brings, I mean, he changes the sound of the band and, and in a good way, I think, because I think, you know, they needed something a little different. They need a little kind of, kick up the backside, you know, um, the voice, and, and there's great songwriting on this album. The voice is a terrific track. Gemini Dream rocks, uh, 22,000 Days, this big soaring pop prog epic, right? You got uh, Nervous, which is classical and pop, sounds a little like ELO to me in spots, which is kind of interesting. I think it's more the vocal, the, the backing vocal layers. Um, you got the big symphonic swells of Painted Smile, and then you got Reflective Smile, which is a little more playful, and kind of reminds me of early ELP because the vocals have this little kind of like Greg Lake thing going on. I don't know. I, I think it's a really well-produced album. There you go. There's the back of the album. And uh, I like it a lot. I think this is a really, really strong Moody Blues album. And, and again, it kind of gave them a second jump into their career because this this and, you know, the couple after it did fairly well for them. So uh, and I think uh, Patrick Perez was, a, you know, a good addition to the band, although in subsequent years, I think he was underutilized a bit. But uh, but still, this is his shining moment in this band. So yeah, I agree. Uh, Octave was real disappointing. I I didn't like it, and I didn't keep it. I wish I would have because I had a blue vinyl, <laughs> and it was and it's become very rare. Yeah. But uh, no, I got rid of that, and uh, I just felt like Mike Pinder was just like he'd had enough. He was like tired. <laughs> Yeah, but they were yeah. gone. They were they were down from 1972 to 1978. So that's six years. Uh, but anyways, uh, to get back to Patrick Moraz, yeah, uh, Long Distance Voyager was a real surprise. I mean, it was like I'm, I just remember, God, this is just like they got an injection of uh, adrenaline with uh, yeah. Patrick yeah. Moraz. Yeah. But I, like you said, on the next few albums, seems like they they needed him less and less and less. And yeah, well, like Sir Lemaire is just, he's hardly there at all. Yeah, they kind of turn into a pop band, right? It's like, it's an interesting yeah. career because you think, you know, you're absolutely right. I think throughout, they got to a point where I think, uh, you know, there's only so much Mellotron you could put on these albums and, and the Mellotron was starting to get outdated, right? So what else are you going to have Mike Pinder do? You know, talented guy could play some organ and, and some other stuff, but they needed someone who was going to inject some flair. I mean, this was 1981, right? So you got it. Yeah. The music world is changing. I mean, you know, look what a lot of these other prog bands from the 70s did. So I think it was a it was a great move. Uh, unfortunately, I find a lot of the albums that came after it have some good songs, but they became more of a pop band. And then all of a sudden you got this really gifted keyboard player, which doesn't really have a hell of a lot to do anymore, which is a shame. I mean, he made he made some good money, I'm sure. And that's good for him. But uh, I, I, for me, Moraz has always been this guy that I all these flashes of brilliance, but he never kind of stuck around in one place and made his definitive statement. You know, I mean, you could argue that, you know, Relayer and some of these other ones we're going to talk about are his definitive statement, but I, you know, it, it would have been interesting to have him stick around with Yes for a while. It would have been interesting to have 
you know, more of this type of album with him in it, in the band going forward, or, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's almost like you get all these like one hit things from him and which is a shame. And he's such a talent. I mean, he's one of the greats. Oh and, yeah. He, 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 I think he's too talented for the Moody blues. I think that's what it was. Yeah. He could, he could play rings around Mike Pinder. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I, I, I respect and love Mike Pinder. I think the, uh, Moody Blues two through seven are just phenomenal. Oh yeah. But uh, uh, when when it got to the point of like you know hey you guys got to have some hit singles and Gemini Dream is going to be the voice and Gemini Dream we're going with those two over a span of you know whatever and then the next one is the other side of life or no the present and I thought I thought the present was just ugh. I don't even have it. I thought there's one on there that sounds like Running on Empty by Jackson Brown. You know that tune? Sounds just like it. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's... yeah and and uh, I thought, well, if they can't get original anymore, you know, I'm just kind of like out. And I didn't like The Other Side of Life, but I did buy the, the album Sur La Mer because I was at a time like, I wonder what this sounds like. So I bought it, you know. And uh, yeah, I, I think uh, with that band, I kind of gave up on Long Distance Voyager. That was the last one that I really 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 enjoyed yeah yeah like i said the other the one or two that came after have some have moments but this one is consistently really good and i don't think they ever did anything on that level ever again and and yeah i think you're right was he too talented for the moody blues or i'm not too talented but he was a different type of a guy and you know you just think back it's like well you know wouldn't it have been interesting if after long distance voyager maybe one other album that he jumped ship and like put together some really cool project. I mean, because look at like what Asia was doing and GTR and all that kind of stuff and put together something that really allowed him to showcase his skills. And he kind of, he kind of just didn't do that. He kind of was like, all right, I'm along for the ride and we'll, we'll take this as far as it can go. And it, I don't know, I just look at his career, look at back on it and it's like a phenomenal player who I think could have, it's a shame he didn't give us more. I'm not saying he couldn't have, but it's, uh, I, you know, it's just what could have been. I don't know. It just seems to me like a little unrealized potential in, in it. Because you know why? Because I think most of us who talk about him talk about him in such lofty standards. Uh, but then, you know, when people talk about the great rock keyboard players of all time, you know, and the Emersons and the Wakemans and the John Lords always come up in the conversation. And he rarely does. And he should be. And the reason why he doesn't yeah. is because he just, he, it's like he wasn't in the right place all the time. I don't know. It's just weird. So it's a, it's a really, to me, it's a really weird story, Patrick Moraz, because um, we all know how talented he, he is. But um, you look at his body of work and you're like, all right, there's some, there's some flashes of brilliance here. But that like sustained thing I think we're looking for just was never there. Well, he's, he's more of a soundtrack guy. I mean, he's got more soundtracks than Van Gellis. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's good. He's and, made his money. I mean, it's, uh, I'm sure yeah. he, you know, he's not complaining about his career. But, but you don't seem to be able to find any of those albums. They don't show up like on, you know, the different, you know, the regular vendors. You don't see those records. You only see the stuff he did with like rock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So moving on. I'm going to go with this for my number three. Now, originally, the LP was just called I on this on the spine. But if you go, if you look at the album itself, you'll see it says the story of I. Story of I. And it's got the whole story <laughs> and all the lyrics and everything. But I love this album. I mean, I I listened to this to death when it got released. I had it on a track. I was driving around all the time listening to it. And in 1976, it was just, it was the tits. I just thought it was awesome. <laughs> but uh, I love it. Um, it had so many sounds. Like, you know, the very beginning of the whole album, that, that's that really low note with the vocal and all that. That's all the orchestron. I mean, you can do it with a Mellotron, but it wouldn't sound as... You know what I mean? Mellotron has, because of the way those tapes turn and stuff like that, there's always a little bit of a kind of a delay of, like a of, of hearing the song. Yeah, a lag, exactly. Well, with the orchestra on, it was instantaneous. As soon as he hit the key, it was just boom. You know, no attack, uh, lag or anything. It was just 
very and in fact the first song was called impact i mean you know that that really describes the whole thing you're right ray gomez is killer on this and they get into some jam sessions on i forgot the name of the song but i think it's called dancing now or like a child in disguise one of those last ones it's just this is a cool album i mean it's just you can't uh, if you're a progger you have to have this if you're like if you like keyboards but i don't know why they turned it sideways like that that's because that's how it opens you know I always thought it was kind of stupid the way they did that. But. Yeah, I just, you know, it's funny. I was watching you and I just real, I just realized that. So I went, I went and turned my CD booklet around. It looks better that way, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this looks kind of, this looks kind of cool. It's kind of a mirror yeah. kind of thing. Anyways, you said it all on that album. I mean, I like John McBurney, okay. But you're right. A lot of people criticized him and his vocals, you know. But I think nowadays the, the, like you said, the, the millions of Brazilian percussionists and children, uh, they sound like kids yeah. on that, and really young. Very true. Very true. I don't think any of that was necessary, but I think he wanted to, the way the solo albums went out of yes at the time, they were all coming out at once, John Anderson, Chris Squire, Steve Powell, Alan White, and Patrick Mraz, and I think he wanted to separate himself from Yes. I, I don't think he wanted it to sound anything like what he had done with Yes. And and I'll get more to that later, but you know. Anyways, that's cool. That's my number three. So All right. I, story you about Mr. Moraz disappeared from behind you. You may have to like jiggle your Yeah, mind. I turned the television off because it uh the screensaver went on to the never mind. Got gotcha. the login page. <laughs> so I just turned it off. I think everybody saw it, so it's good enough. <laughs> My number three is uh, another one and done band for the most part. They had the one studio album. There's some live stuff you can get, obviously. Uh, Refugee from uh, 1974. With, with a guy that looks just like Phil Collins sitting in the middle, right? <laughs> Brian well, Davison. Yeah, there you go. So basically, this is uh, Patrick Moraz with two guys from the Nice, right? You have uh, Lee Jackson, vocals, bass, and guitars, and Brian uh, Davidson from uh, on drums. And uh, this is the uh, esoteric reissue of this, which has uh, the remastered album and uh, BBC Radio One and concert and live at Newcastle City Hall, all from 1974. It's a nice little package. I mean, if you love the Nice. You love ELP, you've come to the right place. So this is basically big symphonic prog trio music. Uh, it, it's so similar to the nice and ELP, it's crazy, right? You got, it's a great blending of classical and rock. The formula is exactly the same. Of course, you know, the vocals aren't as good as Greg Lake, I would say, but uh, you know, you got the big epic suites, uh, you got the Grand Canyon suites and Credo are the big epics on here, but then you got the wonderful uh, Papillon and, Sunday. It's very enjoyable stuff. It's not quite as good as ELP. Uh, arguably, it's it's on the level of the nice, I think. But uh, you know, it's it's fun stuff. It's all keyboard dominated, and I think Mr. Moraz sounds spectacular on here. There's a lot of wonderful piano and there's synth. I mean, all sorts of different stuff on here. It's definitely worth having if you're into you know early '70s symphonic prog and you like that kind of classical side of it. Uh, and like I said, if you're into the, the whole trio thing. Um, this is a no-brainer, quite good. Another one that uh, kind of like the main horse. I never ever listened to this until they came out with the reissue in 2019. So I'm I'm like real late to the game on both main horse and refugee. Always heard about the well uh, main horse. I never heard of ever, but refugee. I mean that they have a pretty big name out there. Most people have either heard this or heard of it. So uh, it was kind of good to get into this. I dig this. Good stuff. So. Again, showing you a really talented guy. I wish that would he would have gone on longer with that. But if he if he did, he wouldn't have been on the Relayer album. So some things happen for a reason. What was funny was that Melody Maker had this big cover story about Rick Wakeman leaving Yes because of Tales of Topographic Oceans and all that. And they said, who will they get him to replace him? And about that time, the Refugee album was out, and we were listening to it and going, my God, this guy's awesome. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, oh, Patrick Moraz joins Yes. <laughs> I was like, Jeez. are you kidding me? That was the dream. We didn't <laughs> that, even have it. <laughs> that worked out well. 
it was a dream we never thought of. <laughs> I just swear to God, it's like, yeah, it just came out of nowhere. It's like, oh, I know that guy. We listened to him on Refugee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. On my A track, everywhere I went. Yeah, I listened to the crap out of that in Sacramento. Oh my God. So for my number two is, <laughs> you can't go wrong. I mean, some people complain about Lee Jackson's voice, but if you've listened to the nice, you're already aware of that, what it sounds like. You either like them or you don't. But to me, this the music and the songs are so good that who cares? Yeah. Who cares what he sounds like? He I, I don't think he has a bad voice. He's no yeah, Greg Lake. A gruff. Yeah, he's a, he's no Greg Lake, but he's fine. But I mean, there's just there's so much over the top instrumentation on the album that it's almost like the, the vocals are kind of like, all right, we'll just we'll just deal with them, right? You can't see this, but this is oh no wonder I was a blank page. <laughs> all the lyrics are on the uh, LP too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I fell in love with the album. We listened to the crap out of it. In fact, uh, when we went to see PFM in Sacramento, open for Dave Mason, that's a weird building. That's building. Crazy. Me and my friend Elton were in my Volkswagen bus listening to Refugee before we went in. <laughs> but yeah, it was just so good. So that live at Newcastle, I hated that, but uh, yeah, I got that. That's good. I got. I bought that box set. I also have a Japanese CD of it on a Pony Canyon or whatever you call it. And, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> God, they make good CDs. When I get the Japanese CDs, they sound so good. I don't know what it is, but they're incredible. Yeah, yeah this, is a good, this is a good little box set. I mean, and it wasn't expensive. Oh yeah, it's it worth like it. Twenty-five yeah. bucks, I think, for this whole thing. It's like. Totally worth that. Well, they weren't around very long. You're right. They're they're one of my one and dones. I I always wanted to to uh, see another studio album out of those guys, but it wasn't to happen. Mm, no, unfortunately, it wasn't to happen. Yep. Cool. My number two is his other one and done thing, Main Horse from 1971. I'm I'm a big fan of this. If it wasn't for my number one, this would have been my number one. And kind of like I mentioned before. Uh, this is good hard charge and prog rock. You got Peter Lockett on guitar, John Ristori on bass and cello, Bryson Graham on drums, and uh, Mraz on all sorts of keyboards, but mostly organ. I mean, he plays a ton of Hammond organ on here, but there's a little electric piano and some regular piano. But uh, I love introduction, like we talked about before. It's got this heaviness to it that's kind of like vanilla fudge meets deep purple type of thing. Uh, but there is that kind of sophistication on this album, which brings to mind, you know, the nice and ELP, because I think that he just kind of has that flair about him. Uh, Pale Sky and God are, are also really, really good. Uh, the two big epics are, you know, those are the two big epics on the album. And there's lots of jamming on here. I mean, the whole album is pretty rocking and pretty, pretty intense, I think. Uh, yeah, I like this a lot. This, this is, uh, again, one of those bands that, you know, I should have known about back in the day. I never did. I discovered them really late and I was kind of like, wow, where, where have these guys been my whole life? This is pretty exciting stuff. So that's why I've talked about them quite a few times here on the channel already. And it's like, for those who have never listened to Main Horse, their self-titled debut from 71, check it out. Some prime kick-ass Patch McGrath on that album. So. Do you think that Peter Lockett's blues guitar works in that record or should it have been a little bit more melodic? Uh... It works in spots. I mean, he's to me, it's like um, his guitar is kind of not the main focus of the band. I always find, although I, I like his riffs are pretty cool. Yeah, his lead work at times is a little kind of almost like it doesn't fit. Like it's because it's not a blues rock album, right? But he's kind of I don't know. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I don't know. I, I yeah. the solos for me. I, I'm listening to Mraz most of the time, but there is plenty of guitar on the album. It's just loud and abrasive. And I think, uh, you know, that, that's why I keep, it, it's kind of like you got Mraz that's, who's doing all this really intricate stuff, but he's also, he's playing like the, with fuzz on the organ. So that's, you know, you kind of have that vanilla fudge, deep purple thing. And then you got this guitar player who comes in who probably would have been better suited for just a straight hard rock band. But it, for me, it works. I don't know. I, I kind of dig it. Yeah, you know, I just wondered, because kind of, kind of reminds me of Buddy Guy. Buddy Guy's got a real twangy tone and, and and he's very aggressive and uh 
it, it kind of just, you know, he just comes in just wailing. Yeah. I, I just, I was listening to it last night going, just imagine somebody else like Steve Hackett on this or, you know. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know. Randy Latimer for that matter. Or how about a Robert Fripp? Oh, yeah, exactly. That's another thing I was going to say, too. I think Patrick Moraz is the Robert Fripp of main horse instead of guitar. It's keyboards. He comes in lots of dissonance, lots of distortion. I love a Hammond with distortion, you know. And uh, they just overloaded a Marshall, basically. That's how they got that sound. Thank you, John Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I was just like... I, I I just kept running it through my head. I go, you know, yeah, exactly. What about Robert Fripp? It would have been whoa. <laughs> well, well, I mean, because I'm just thinking, like, a fantastic good job. Yeah, I you know, because we're talking about 1971 here. So just think of what Fripp's doing in '71, and that would have been kind of interesting, right? Because we're not quite yet at uh, the big loud. We're almost there. The big loud Fripp stuff, you know, from uh, Lizard. Yeah, it's, so it's lizard era, right? So he's he's going yeah. through the jazzy phase, right? So I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, as it is, I'm I'm happy with the main horse album as it is. So it's you know. Oh yeah, and that's another one and done. Yeah. Just can't find anything else. But by the way, they do have a couple of songs from some movie. I found it on Spotify. It's a French movie. <coughs> Excuse me, French movie. I can't remember the name of it, but it's not it's not very good. No, if, you know it's different. When you do soundtracks, you have to placate to the director more than what you want to do yeah see true. main horse and main horse was what they wanted to do yep yep exactly well how's hey, i know what our number ones are going to be <laughs> what can i say about this record oh my god this is the stephen wilson remix i've got in my hand it just oh my god if you don't own this, if you're a yes fan and don't own this, you don't deserve to breathe. <laughs> Just I'm, I'm pretty sure if, if 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 I see anybody in the comments who claims that they're a yes fan, they don't have relayer, I'd be very surprised. I've never seen anybody write I hate relayer. Yeah. I told the story about my ex-girlfriend, Marie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She right. hated it, but that's, that's an exception, different. right? Yeah. That's a different, yeah, that's an exception. Uh oh my god. They were going to put this album out as a four piece without a keyboard player. Kind of like what Judas Priest was talking about. But uh, by the way, I loved your rants on those. But uh, this album came at us. They recorded it at Chris Squire's home studio. It sounded like crap on the original vinyl and on the eight track tape and on the cassette. And for years and years and years, it sounded like crap. You could hear some sort of a, a buzzing through it, at, it in the quiet moments. He's like, what the hell? And it's just like somebody didn't get whatever. But uh, Rhino put out a reissue in 2003, and they got rid of that hum. I don't know how they did it. But Stephen Wilson just brought this album out of the garbage can and made it sound just tremendous. And uh, the 5.1 surround sound of this is... So cool. Uh, Gates of Delirium. Oh my God, what can you say? Yeah. It, it starts out with Patrick Moraz. He's just kind of just in the background, just twinkling around on his ivories, just going absolutely ape shit while Steve Howe's doing all those little licks and stuff. And, and then it, the, the climax that, that, I mean, the big war scene that goes crazy, you can hear Patrick Mraz hitting an electronic slinky, like with a drumstick or something. I think it's Patrick Mraz, because they used it on the Refugee album. I think it was his idea to hook up a microphone to a slinky and just hit it. And it, that's how they get that <laughs> sound. I've seen it live twice uh, with Patrick Mraz, 1975 and 1976. Oh, I did want to say when he did his solo spot, when they did the Yes Solos tour in 76, General John Open. Um, he played yeah. Papillon by himself on the piano. And we were just like, oh my God. And that's when we we realized he was neck and neck or maybe better than Keith Emerson as far as speed. I mean, the guy goes so fast, never makes a mistake. It's just amazing stuff. But when I saw him do Sound Chaser, it was like in heaven because that's like my favorite 
Patrick Mraz, everything, you know. It's it to me, it's all in Sound Chaser. They gave him free reign to do whatever the hell he wanted for nine minutes. I mean, you know, but can you imagine Relayer coming out without a keyboard player? No, I, I no. Can't. Or touring as a four piece, it would it would just not have happened. I don't think. No. Nope, so it turned out that, and it's fate because Van Gellis was going to be the keyboard player, but he couldn't get a visa. This is the story out of the official story book. Aren't we glad that he couldn't get that visa? Yeah, it's all Greek to me. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, you, know, you have to wonder too if they if all right so yes. i always love playing the what if game so like what if that whole thing with van gallus had worked out and he did he was the what the guy on this album you have to wonder would he have stuck around a little bit longer and kind of prevented the wakeman coming back or was wakeman always going to come back because it's just weird how this all all this stuff kind of worked out right but um well that was really surprising because huh? you know we thought Mraz was in I mean, in because he played two tours two years in a row. I, yeah. I saw him at the Cow Palace both times. And then all of a sudden, what? Mraz is gone. He saw it in Melody Maker or something on the rack, you know? Because, you know, again, in those days, it, you had to really struggle to find things out. You yeah. know, nobody, nothing. You couldn't go up to a, a record store guy at the counter and ask him a question about some musician. They had no clue. No idea. And they weren't looking in Billboard or Cashbox to find out. So I'd borrow those magazines for five minutes on next to the counter and just read, 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 just to try to learn, you know? But anyways, yeah, all of a sudden they were talking about the Going for the One album. And originally it was going to be called the New, the, the, the new, the new Yes album. They were going to call it that. Thank God they didn't. That would have been a horrible title. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so all this, and then Mraz goes, I wrote most awake uh, of Awaken. They, they just literally ripped it off from me. He was really pissed. <laughs> and then he got into the Moody Blues and, you know, history went on. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Relayer is, it's not my favorite Yes album, but it's real close. Close to the Edge is my favorite, but I, I love Relayer so much. It's Yeah, Relayer for me is, you know, it's hard to be close to the edge, but I, this has generally always been my number two. There have, there have been times in my life where I proclaim this, my favorite yes album, but uh, it's amazing. Three tracks. It's very, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's very similar to close to the edge in the way it's set up, you know, the epicness of it all and these three, you know, long tracks and what have you. And, but yeah, sound chaser is just absolutely, you know, one of, I think, uh, Mraz as well as Howe's greatest moments are on that track. I think. Um, yeah. It's amazing stuff. So frenetic. Obviously, the guys were listening to a lot of jazz fusion at the time. And it, oh, yeah. you, you can tell, right? I mean, it's. Just... Oh, yeah, they, they they were. They were listening to Mob Vishnu Orchestra and uh, Return to Forever, and especially Hymn of the Seventh Galaxy. I think um, that album was very, very influential on Relayer. Yeah. yeah it's Cause, good cause it was just like pure aggression until to be over. As a nice experiment, one time I tried it. Uh, I played Sound Chaser first, then I played To Be Over, and then I played Gates of Delirium. And that is a killer way to listen to that album. Because it's, it's so different. different. It ends so peaceful with soon. Yeah, true, right? That's almost like a great, that's that's almost like a great way to end the album that way, right? And you can do the same thing with Close to the Edge. You can play Siberian Cut True and End You and I, and then Close to the Edge, and it has those little bird chirping in the end, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like going in reverse, but it it actually does work. Hmm. Interesting. I never thought about doing that. Very yeah. Cool. I'm very yeah. mad. So I've got a, I've got a um honorable wait, mentions. Did you choose yours yet? It's the same one of yours. Right, right. I just wanted to make sure you said everything you wanted to say. Yeah. I was going to do an honorable mention on something that probably nobody knows about. It's called the Mraz Albin Project. A guy named Greg Albin who plays drums. And uh, I got a, there's a, like a big poster in there. I don't want it to fall out, but look at this, uh, all this trouble they went to do this record. I mean, this, this thing, it's got. <laughs> wow. That's a hell of a package, huh? That's a lot of fold outs. One, yeah. For one disc, a lot of liner notes. <laughs> He doesn't say what kind of keyboards he uses, but this came out, and uh, just to get to it, it, this came out in 2014. Here's a good picture of, of his keyboards. 
Hmm. They just the two guys that do it, you know, and they call themselves Map, and they did this in two, 2014, and then after that, nothing. <laughs> just Jeez, gone. Christ. But it's different. It's not the kind of, um, it's hard to describe what this is like. How would you just describe this? It was like, um, it's very electronic. It's kind of like Mraz Bruford flags. It's kind of like okay. if you're into that album, you might like this. This is, a, you know, it's got some saxophone solos and all kinds of guest musicians on it, stuff people I've never heard of. But uh, it's good. It's nice and, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Tasty. But it's kind of hard to find it, I think. Uh, it's not even on the streaming services. Yeah, I've never heard it before. Yeah, it's. Yeah, I had my honorable mentions. I, I'm going to go with uh, the the two for the first two Mraz Bruford albums, Music for Piano and Drums from '83 and Flags from '85. Those are pretty good. Um, I don't love either one of them, but I think that they're it's you know what it is. It's like it's it, what they're doing is great on it, but I'm always, I'm almost like I want to hear like a whole band doing that stuff because I think I think the the compositions are really cool and they're interesting, but at times I'm like, all right. You know, 45 minutes of uh, piano and drums. Great. But man, how much better would it have sounded with a bass player and a guitar player, right? Same, same thing. And Flags is a little bit different because Flags, has, has obviously, he decided to introduce synths and other things on there. And there's uh, electronic drums on there. So I think that is, is kind of a little fuller sound, I think. But it's 85 and it kind of sounds a little mid 80s dated. But I mean, the playing on both of those albums are really, really good. So you really can't fault them yeah. much at all. I just, for me, I would have liked to have heard those two guys. I mean, I mean, there's a perfect example of what I was talking about before. How you had, you know, Mraz in, you know, in the Moody Blues kind of doing these really safe albums. It wouldn't have been cool to hear him break out and do this, you know, really cool band project. And Mraz Bruford could have been it. You know, throw a couple extra guys in there and bam, you got the next super group. And it really wasn't, so... You know, I didn't get it, and I should have because I do like the guy. But Kazumi Watanabe, we know we're fans of that guy, right? Didn't he do one with Mraz called Kilowatt? It's supposed to be killer. Kilowatt is a really good album. I guess yeah, Mraz on that album, he might be. I, I should have got that because uh, I I I heard that they just let Mraz go berserk on that thing. It's uh, who is it? It's Kazumi Watanabe. Uh, I forgot the bass player. I'm gonna look it up right because Jeff Berlin did a couple albums with him as well. Right, the Spice of Life. Yeah. Yeah. So I got those. I even got the DVD. I think I told it about a year ago or something, but it cost me like sixty-five dollars. <laughs> the kill. Yes. Yeah. Patrick Merez is on here. So this was 1989. Yeah. I don't know if I used to have this on cassette. I don't think I have it on CD. So kill. You said he right? is or isn't. He is, yeah. So oh, it's, it's Kazumi, yeah. it's Bunny Brunel on bass, John right. Lennon on drums, and then Wayne Shorter on sax on a couple tracks. Patrick Mraz plays keyboards on five tracks. Oh, my God. Alex Acuna. Yeah, so that's, uh, I used to have that on cassette. That's a really good album. I totally oh, that's a wish list. That. I got to get in. I got to get on that one. Uh, I completely forgot. I, that probably would have would have made my list if I had remembered it because wow. that's really good. Yeah, the, Kazumi Watanabe is a terrific guitar player. Oh, he's got like a oh, million God. albums. A million albums. Oh God, yeah, he's incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I'm glad you brought that up. So for those of you wondering about that one, uh, Kilowatt is the album. Kazumi Watanabe is the uh, guitar player, and. Uh, Killer, killer lineup on there. He's got a bunch of really good fusion albums, quite a few actually, that have some very notable players uh, that everybody knows, like uh, Bruford and um, uh, Jeff Berlin and all sorts of yeah. Other. So yeah, he's played with a lot of people. Yeah. So cool. Cool. So there you have it, everybody. Our uh, our favorite albums featuring the talents of Mr. Patrick Mraz, uh, keyboard virtuoso. In the comments below, please list some of your favorite albums that um, Mr. Mraz has appeared on, and or you know, hit it up. Whatever. There you go. And while you're at it, click on the link below and get yourself a C Tranquility shirt. The whale design is quite good, and we have two new designs 
on the, uh, the, the store right now. So the link is below uh, as soon as I get my shirts with the new designs that we have one uh, Monsters Den and one kind of cool new SOT logo, like a prog thing with all the planets and stuff. It's very, very neat. So check that out below. I'll be uh, modeling them off as soon as I get mine. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, of course. We're here on YouTube all oh, the damn time. Damn time. And I want to thank Rand for joining in today. This little discussion of Patrick Baraz and uh, for Rand, I am Pete. See you all real soon here on the channel. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.